we will be recording today's session. So if you have staff members that are unable to participate, you can direct them to the recording on our webinar once we complete today's session. And we're really just the ins and outs of how do you work the program from a procedural standpoint? How do you determine income eligibility? Um, anything that's different between EVP versus how? And feel free to ask questions also. Uh, we do have over 400 people uh, register for today's event and counting as um, people are signing on, but please feel free to ask questions in the question tab. If I don't get to your question right away, it's probably because it's in another slide. Don't be um, nervous about that. And if for some reason I can't get to your question, please reach out to me directly. I'll be sharing also our EDP How Team contact list at the end of today's presentation. All right, like I said, we have a very packed agenda today. Um, we're going to talk about why these programs are so important for homebuyers um, ever more than now, with the way that the housing market and interest rate environment is. We're going to compare the programs procedurally. They operate the same, but they do have some nuances. We're going to go through the workflow. How do you reserve funds for your borrowers? And how is your organization going to be successful through that process? We're going to talk about what's your responsibilities as the member for our program. And then we're also going to get into the weeds about the household eligibility, which includes the income practices, calculations, any reminders and tricks. And when it comes to the compliance and underwriting aspect, before I had joined the base, this will be my sixth year doing EBP and how, but before that, I was in processing, underwriting, closing. So I speak the same language as you all, and you know, all these questions, I can be able to answer them, hopefully. So um, feel free to always reach out. All right, so these two programs, they're so important. Um, I mean, there's a lot of flexibility. A lot of people will kind of say that there is a complexity because of the income aspect, but don't let that ever be something to act as a deterrent. There's so many positives about these programs. It's really just beginning with that self-education so you can avidly work with your borrowers. Um, it is income eligibil eligibility based, and there are extra components in treating it as a separate underwriting layer. For your organization however there's so many things that we do not take into consideration we don't perform asset tests we do not care about loan to value we do not look at fico score um, those are the key selling points when you're working with your borrowers as well as your origination staff when you are doing your initial whether it's a formal pre-approval program or a prequal um, these are things that are more impactful than people like to um, kind of think when they're going through how can we get these borrowers into our pipeline and reserve funding for them. We're also not asking you to invent mortgage products. It's what you're using is what is friendly with us. Um, if you ever have questions about any products, feel free to reach out to us. But, um, you know, it can be anything from FHA to conventional to jumbo to fixed. VA, USDA, um, any other state housing finance agencies, depending on where you're located in New England, and ARMS are also acceptable. One thing about ARMS is we do not accept anything under a 5-1, and our uh, cap, our threshold is 2 and 6, so we won't do a 525 or a 626. But if you ever have ARMS, feel free to reach out because I know that that's pretty attractive right now in this high interest rate environment. Um, you can also pair this money with other grants and down payment and closing cost assistance. We're not lean sensitive. Layer, layer, layer as many resources that your borrowers qualify for. We sometimes see ourselves sitting in fourth lean position. Um, people find that to be very interesting, but I think that's what's also the, the best kept secret about our programs. 
Also, it has potential to qualify for your CRA credit. We know we're all um, being told do more, do more, and the Federal Home Loan Bank of Boston has that resource for your organization to be able to do more. Also, it's a grant. So that is the one thing you have to think about for an incentive for your income eligible buyers. It is forgivable after five years. There's no monthly P&I. They can subordinate as many times as they want, whether they want to do a cash out or a home equity line of credit. We promote equity in the home. So that's also a huge factor that I really want you to uh, take as a takeaway when you're talking to your borrowers. We do have a comparison grid that's on our website and it was included in the notice of change. I will have this reference in, a, um, in the next slide, but the key elements to really understand the differences um, for this year, especially because we have made some enhancements to both programs. So for this year, for the EDP, it is a maximum grant of 29,000 EDP for new people it is specifically for at or below the 80% area median income. We're going to talk about how we define AMI. And then the HOW program, we have removed the match component for those who are returning, or maybe you heard about the program prior to applying this year, and maybe um, we're a little hesitant to offer it because of that parameter. So we've removed that, and our maximum grant is 10% of the sales price or up to 25000 So for instance, if somebody is buying a house for 260000 the maximum grant that they can receive is 25000 And that is for slightly above that 80% area median income and up to 120. And like I said, we'll get into the weeds about that today. And We've also, because these grants have increased, we've also increased your institution's maximum threshold. So for EBP, it is 350,000 for each member financial institution. And for how it is 260,000. It is on a first come first serve basis. We'll talk about that as well today. And then our minimum down payment of the borrower's own funds for EDP, it is still at the 500,000. And because we have removed the match component for the HAL program, the minimum down payment of the buyer's own funds is 3%. So this is a little different than Fannie and Freddie. We do kind of mash up the Fannie Freddie elements um, to their underwriting, and then we have some HUD nuances. It does have to be their own funds. All right, like I said, here is our fully detailed comparison grid for both the programs. Some additional things I want to highlight um, in addition to the prior slide is that the program can be used for down payment and closing cost assistance. Um, that is something new for the HAL program as of this year. Uh, since its inception, it's always been for down payment only. We know that that has become an administrative burden for ourselves at the Federal Home Loan Bank, but as well as your institution. So it can be for closing costs and then really just adding more flexibility, especially in this high interest rate environment. We say customary closing costs, so it cannot be for prepaids and escrows. However, we did get a lot of inquiries about the interest rate buy downs, and yes, how can be for that because EVP, we also permit that. Um, so something to keep in mind, for EDP, you can use it for rehab assistance. Um, we're going to get into that today, but that's not an eligible use for the HOW program. Uh, the HOW program has a purchase price limit, and that is based on the IRS's mortgage revenue bond. You do have to annually apply every year for our programs. Um, and it does have to be for owner-occupied primary residences. And for EDP, because it is a regulated program by the FHFA, we have a requirement, a regulatory uh, requirement, if you will, to um, have your institution reserve 
your first one third of enrollments to first time home buyers. And we do default to the HUD definition of never owning a home, hasn't owned a home in three years, single displaced homemaker. Um, and if you ever have questions, feel free to reach out. And then once your organization has met that one third threshold, you are eligible to enroll non first time home buyers. How we don't have that requirement. However, if they are not a first time home buyer, they do have to sell the property either prior to or simultaneous closings. All first time home buyers do have to complete education and counseling. We're going to talk about that. And there is a five year retention period on both programs. And I do actually have a question related to this. What happens if they sell within the five years? So we do talk about this in our disbursement training, but there is potential that monies will be due back to the federal home loan bank. But the way you have to look at it, it's based on a pro rata share. It's a very complicated calculation that we do at the federal home loan bank, not your institution. It's not a simple payoff, but for every, day or month that they've lived in the home. We calculate it both ways to be able to alleviate and diminish any money due to us. Um, so the longer they've lived in the property, the less that they're going to have due back. So essentially, when you're talking to your borrowers, they're never going to have to pay back the entire amount. And then for EDP, we do have a requirement to have a member concession. We talk about that at the application training, but it's just something like whether it is a waive, waiving or reduction of a fee or a lender credit, a below market rate, expanding your underwriting guidelines, maybe you're waiving a MI. Those are examples of a concession. It's not required for how, but we do get a lot of people asking, well, can we also emulate this for the how program just to make sure that when we're working with our borrowers that we're kind of mirroring that aspect. Yes, you absolutely can. Um, it's optional, not required. The member concession, just so people know, is linked to our regulation with the Federal Housing Finance Agency. And because HOW is a voluntary program, this is one of the, the nuances. And I do see a lot of questions about income limits. We're gonna get to that today. Um, one thing about the 3% or the how program, does it have to be indicated on the purchase and sales agreement? So you can either have it on the purchase and sales agreement or an addendum to the PNF. If it is a hybrid of it's done before and at closing, we caution you just to really make sure that you have your figures punched very, um, very rigid, if you will, before closing and making sure they have met that 3% of their own funds. It cannot be a gift. Um, we do accept any gift funds outside of the minimum requirement, but I do just caution you when you go down that road, just to make sure your organization's table funding the grant. So if for some reason at the CD level, uh, they haven't met that 3% minimum, that obviously puts your institution in jeopardy of not being reimbursed for the grant. So that's a very good question. And if you ever have questions about those types of numbers, feel free to reach out to us. We're more than happy to review those figures just to make sure, because we do understand your table funding this grant. And that actually is going into a great segue for our workflow. So if you're new to the program, or maybe you have had some staff turnover, what's the workflow? How does this operate um, from start to finish. So you submit all your income eligible buyers through our online platform. It's a community lending login. And if you do not have a community lending login, I do recommend after today's program, you uh, request an account if you will be submitting your borrowers for your institution. First step, if it's a home buyer and they reach out to us, we will direct them to your institution. We do have all of our approved banks and credit unions on our website right now by each of the six New England states. We tell them that you are able to peruse our website. There's home buyer FAQs if they ever have questions, but they're really working with your organization for income eligibility. We do not work directly with home buyers. The way that they are able to be um, eligible for this program is working with your organization, which is our customer essentially. 
So once your borrower has a fully executed PNS and has all the income documentation, the disclosure, anything that's pertinent to the enrollment aspect of it in our online uh, portal that you're going to enter all this information to calculate the income, we're going to talk about that today, you're then able to complete step one. We do not accept offers, and that's because we it's always on a first come first serve basis. We do have a lot of reservations that we complete our reviews. So getting to step two, your organization submits the enrollment, and that's where the online calculations begin to be, begin to build. And then you submit to our EDP How team. It's a two tier review, and please allow 15 business days for us to review and determine if that reservation is income eligible. Once we've given the green light and has issued an email saying that this home buyer has been approved, your institution will then close the first mortgage, table fund the grant, and then you will execute our note and mortgage and work through the steps of post-closing to submit the disbursement, which is the reimbursement of the grant. So that's also our final step for the online portal. You're going to compile that all, you're going to submit it through the disbursement request, and then our EBP How team will review that. It's also a two chair review. And please allow 20 businesses for us to fund your Ideal Way account. We do build a little extra lead time, especially for month end reconciliation. Sometimes we have a bit of a holding period. And one of the questions is 15 business days, is this the average turn time or the max? So that's our maximum. I would say, honestly, the last four years, we've probably turned these around 10 calendar days. We can never make any guarantees, especially because every year our allocation schedule is different. Um, we're actually going to be talking about that in the next slide. So this year's allocation schedule, we are doing three months this year, and um, each program has a separate pool of money. As I mentioned, it's on a first come, first serve basis, and our first release is April 3rd, and instead of just releasing it in monthly trenches, we're going to break it up. We're going to do the first business day of the month and then mid-month. Um, April, May, and June. And that's for both of our programs. Like I said, they're separate pools of money. And the reason I we build in that 15 business day turnaround time is specifically because we never know what our final allocation is for both programs. It's always subject to change. Uh, this is because EBP, for those who um, are new to our housing community investment programs, the FHFA requires all federal home loan banks to take 10% of their year-end earnings and put it toward affordable housing. And within that 10%, 15% goes to what the reg requires, a home ownership set aside, which is our EVP program. The Federal Home Loan Bank of Boston has done a fantastic job the last, you know, six years and counting since I've been at the bank and always putting in more than the regulatory stature. Um, and this year we have a little over five and a half million, give or take. Like I said, it's subject to change. And for the HOW program, we have 5.1. So if you are returning a healthier number compared to last year, and that really is because the bank's business model is based on generating liquidity through advances from institutions. So with low interest rate environments, with the Fed having attractive rates, that's great for your institution's liquidity, but for the federal home loan bank's business model, that does um, trickle down to what we put toward affordable housing. So because interest rates have increased, we do have a healthier um, release, and we're gonna be just doing the trenches in equal amounts. So stay tuned for that, and once we do our first release April 3rd, you'll be able to see what the pool has and also reference our funding schedule. And one of the questions is, can you enter an application for review of income without a PNS? So 
we do not do pre-qual or pre-approval reviews for income. Your organization, once we do release the first um, period on April 3rd, you have access to our online system, so you can play around on the income eligibility. But if your buyer does not have a PNS, you can't reserve it and we can't review it. And this is because when we're talking about the income eligibility, it's based on that new subject property. It's not where they currently live. And we're going to go through the whole income eligibility because I do see a couple of questions about that, um, and I hope that answers your question. So the home buyer requirement is to execute the disclosure, of course. Um, the one thing to be mindful of is that we are not qualifying income. We are compliance income. So we recommend treating this as an extra layer within your underwriting flag that that we are prospective you should complete this um outside of what you're qualifying for because we're all in for everybody who lives in the household um and we're looking at the hud area median income limit for either program and we're going to get into the weeds about that today it's anticipated in perspective so this is where I like to tell people we're a blend between HUD, Fannie, and Freddie income guidelines. The HUD aspect is we don't care about seasonability. So if Fannie and Freddie require two years uh, of that income to um, qualify, we're different. They could begin receiving overtime only for a month. We're going to project that out and we're going to include that in our income. So this is why it's different and very helpful for you to look at that disclosure with your borrower, have the conversation. This is an extra underwriting um, layer, if you will. Like I said, the fully executed p and and um, that is because that property is what is going to be reserved, and that is how the system is gonna qualify and determine the income el eligibility based on the HUD area median income. I do have a question regarding the pool of funds. If most recent pool funds are all gone, should we wait until the next disbursement period to submit the application or can we submit it before? That's a great question. So once we do our first release on April 3rd, you have access to the income portion of our online portal. So if the money does run out, it's not gonna let you reserve that home buyer. However, you can take that income part as far as you can and then upon the next release so for example if you miss out on april 3rd and you have everything you need to get ready for the next release which is april 17th once there is money in the pool you can then complete the enroll household portion and um we recommend that if you do have all your ducks in a row, please use our online system it's a good, great resource to determine income eligibility especially if you are um, working with a buyer that might be like very close to either program because of course they're only income eligible for one or the other and then also just making sure you've verified and documented that the uh, minimum contribution of the buyer's own funds completing that first time home buyer education and counseling we'll talk about that and then our regulatory hard stop is your borrower cannot receive more than 250 cash back we like to be transparent of that so you're not closing and table funding the grant and then all of a sudden um, realizing that they got excess cash back. All right, we do have a couple of questions. Can money paid toward the appraisal and the home buyer's insurance be used to go toward the minimum borrower contribution if paid at closing? That's a great question. So the appraisal, yes, because that is a customary closing cost. Um, we do caution and making sure you have that conversation with your borrower. If it's something that is a customary closing cost that is in A, B, and C, which trickles down to the B, loan cost, yes, you can do that. However, insurance, no, because that is under the prepaid and escrow section. So if you ever have questions about whether a borrower has completed their minimum, 
please reach out to us. Like I said, we're more than happy to uh, work the numbers with you. We want to set you up for success. So if you're ever unsure, always reach out. Can the program be used for multifamily homes, condos, and PUDs? Great question. So for the property type, it can be for a single family, two to four families, condos. Uh, we do not care if the condo is approved through CPM. We don't have any requirements of, uh, like Fannie and Freddie do, about the 10% um, entity of ownership if somebody owns more than one unit. It doesn't have to be a warrantable condo. And yes, we do accept PUDs. We also um, modular homes, uh, model homes, as well as manufactured homes, and even cooperatives. All right, so when you're interviewing your potential home buyers, you're gonna review that disclosure with them. The disclosure, the first four pages are informational for your borrower. Please do not use the uh, last year's version. Go to our website, purge everything that you possibly can, and um, making sure that they understand that it is everybody who lives in the property that we're looking at for um, identifying and building that household makeup. In addition, we're all in for everybody who has income and that means if you have one borrower and you have a household of four, maybe you have two minors who are under 18 and then you have two adults who receive W-2 income, that's a household of four with two W-2 wage earners and we need all of that income. So I'm getting some questions about uh, non-owner occupied. So we do not include them in the household count you can submit a borrower if they are income eligible, if they have a non-occupant co-borrower. Um, we don't include them in the household makeup and we don't include their household income. However, you're gonna want to get something in writing and this is in our procedures and income guidelines that can be accessed on our website that the um, non-occupant co-borrower will not be residing in the property and getting those letters executed if for some reason they have a high uh, debt to income ratio and your uh, compensating factor is specifically about um, that non-occupant co-borrower is going to be giving a monthly stipend to that buyer to be able to support the mortgage that is a circumstance where we would consider using their income um, it's a rarity, but sometimes if that is being used as a compensating factor to uh, determine uh, their ability to repay, we would include it. And then just really making sure that you're cross-referencing what's on that disclosure, what do you have for documentation, and making sure you're doing a manual underwrite and projection to see that all income is fully vetted and fix and ties out. Some other things. Um, if you have a buyer that's an employee of your institution, you're going to want to make sure that you have a executed, signed and dated on company letterhead that that buyer who is an employee does not have access or any um, access to their enrollment and they are um, completely removed from that process. I know we talked about non-occupant co-borrowers. Um, full-time students, so um, anyone that is 18 years or older, including full-time students, we do include their income. If you have a full-time student, you're going to want to confirm, is it not head of the household? Because if it is, we are going to include all of that income. If it's a full-time student and you have documentation of a transcript or um, a schedule, evidencing their full-time status and not part-time, we cap off their income at $480 annual. And that goes to that HUD component that I said that is different from Fannie and Freddie. Um, when it comes to the 50-50 custody, so if you have a borrower that has 50-50 custody and you have that documented, we do include those 
children a part of head of the household. If you ever have questions about the custody part of it, please reach out to us and, and let us know. We're more than happy to work through that. And with that being said, whether the custody aspect is 50-50, we do include child support and alimony as income. So if you're not using it for qualifying due to seasonability, um, we do. And I recommend really, in addition to today's training, cover to cover going through our income guidelines. They're extremely detailed. And I think that our team has done a stellar job at making sure we um, try to come up with any unique circumstance that maybe your institution hasn't seen because I know at my job prior to joining the Federal Home Loan Bank, if it was something that was out of the ordinary and we could not determine that two-year um, seasonability, if you will, we would just kind of say, well, we're not going to use it, um, and it, there's no harm, no foul. With us, we're all in, so it has to be um, everything that we get. Our non-U.S. citizens eligible, an example, permanent resident aliens or non-permanent resident aliens. So we do not have any restrictions on that. As long as you are able to follow your first mortgage financing, whether you're keeping it in-house or you're selling it on the secondary market, I just want to caution you that making sure you have all of their income. And if for some reason they are not documented, for example, we need some sort of documentation to capture their income. So if they're being paid under the table, you're going to have to find a way to uh, be able to show those income resources. Do teenagers' summer jobs count toward household income? So yes, if they're 18 years or older, absolutely, it does it does count. And if they're not a full-time student, so if they are a full-time student or they're in high school or college, you're just going to want to make sure you look at our income guidelines and document that they are a full-time student. Our, um, our system does require certain documents to be uploaded to get um, the annual amount of $480. So if you ever have questions about that, let us know. But also that adult household members, especially if they're in, um, in college and they go away, they're technically a part of that household. They end up coming back. Um, some people commute. Um, we all just stay any age that, you know, some uh, some age brackets are kind of negatively impacted on housing, unfortunately, due to inflation. So um, if you ever have questions about whether to include someone as a household member or um, their income, like I said, please reach out to us. So best practices when you're calculating income, like I said um, before, do a manual calculation against our system. Our system is pretty sophisticated in the sense that the way our income guidelines are written, building that table really should accurately project. However, it can't factor in everything. For example, maybe somebody uh, didn't start their current employer um, where they get a, uh, a pay stub, if you will, and they started not on January 1st of this year, but they started maybe in March it's not going to be able to project that income out correctly. Um, for example, if somebody um, took a leave of absence, whether it was paid or unpaid, or maybe they took a maternity leave where it's a short-term disability, so it's a lower stipend. If you ever see those abnormalities, I definitely recommend getting a verification of employment um, if you are able to access a Fannie Mae. 1005, um, and that way you can be able to accurately project. We do require either pay subs or VOE for wage earners. Um, please do not give us both, but in certain circumstances that I've just demonstrated, uh, this really does vary from your secondary market. Um, so it's just important that when you do that manual, if something doesn't tick and tie what you have calculated on paper, it could be something, whether it's transposing a number, or maybe it's these factors that I've provided as an example. So like I said, review the income guidelines. And our online system does generate, um, based on the HUD income limits. So a lot of questions about the HUD income limits so far. So um, we're finally at this part of today's training. So for right now, we are going to be uh, defaulting to the 2022 HUD income limits. 
Um, we are at the mercy of HUD. Um, we do not have any affiliation with the HUD income limits. So sometimes when we release our, maybe sometimes our two first funding rounds, give or take, uh, we have to use the prior calendar years. So that's what you're going to be using until HUD has notified everybody that they've done their 2023s. I sometimes gauge it between May and June. I just want to let you all know, though, is once we do shift over to it, um, we will provide ample notice. And if we do have people who are kind of in that limbo period, we will work with you to make sure that we're not declining people um, due to that nuance. Um, I think it's very important if you do have people started in the system and maybe they don't qualify. Um, typically, the HUD income limits only increase, um, especially in New England. I've, it's a rarity that I've seen counties decrease, although sometimes in northern New England it does happen. Um, I think that due to inflation, I think the numbers are definitely going to increase compared to this example that I've provided from last year uh, for a household of four in the Boston, Cambridge, Quincy area. So we don't use a me median family income. We're doing it per person in the household. So this is an example of a household of four. And if they are qualifying for EBP, the um, maximum AMI threshold is $111,850. And if for some reason they are over by a dollar, you then would go to the how. And because HUD does not go up past 80% of the AMI, we had to get a little creative on how to project. And we do feel confident that these numbers are pretty in trend with uh, the HFAs. Um, because we're all of New England, we can't just default to the HFAs um, AMI limits. And also to keep them um, procedurally the same as the EBP. So for how we take that 50%, so this is at $70,100. You're going to times it by two to get that to 100%. And then you're going to times it by 1.2 to get to that full 120. So for how, based on this example of a household of four, is $168,240. And where can we find what cities and states can be used for EBP? So it's all of New England. So if your institution lends outside of where your branches or headquarters are located, you can offer this outside of where your shop is located, um, just as long as they um, are in New England. EBP does have a small subset that we do allow outside of New England, but at time of application, your institution would have had to have submitted special paperwork for that. Um, sometimes we see it in New York just because it's so close to New England. Um, if you ever have questions in the future, please feel free to reach out. However, um, that uh, deadline has already surpassed for how it always has to be in New England and we don't have that little special subset that we do for EVP. All right, we do have a couple more questions. For the money down being, for the money down payment being the borrower's own funds, does this include if they pay for their homeowner's insurance in advance or just EMD? So homeowner's insurance, um, that we do not consider that an eligible source. If it's something like their appraisal that is a customary loan cost, um, prepaid and escrows are, are not always the same for every um, every borrower and every first mortgage. So we start entering a customer enrollment before the release date. So the answer is no. So once we have um, released the money on April 3rd, every institution will have access to the system. And that's because we want to make sure people aren't front loading. We want to give equal opportunity for all institutions, whether you're a larger bank or a smaller credit union, also, there are people who are new to the program and there are some seasonable uh, institutions. So we just want to try to begin on an equal playing field. And if you ever have questions and you are new and you're hesitant to submit somebody, we'll give you the technical assistance. But until we've done our first drop, you will not have access to the system. Um, is the most recent pool? Oh, we already, I did answer that, sorry. Um, can a father with partial custody 
count the children as in the household. So yes, they can. So if it's 50 50, um, you can include that. Is the primary borrower is a first time home buyer, but the co borrower is not? Can they still be eligible for EBP? Um, that is a good question. Um, typically, I would say no, but if they don't own a property right now and you can be able to determine that, I would have to really look through the HUD income, um, the HUD first time homebuyer definition. If you have any documentation demonstrating that they don't own a property, I would say that um, it would still constitute that. All right, hold on. I got more. I got lots of questions here. This is great. Um, if you if you are purchasing a multifamily, is this is the potential rent included? Yes. So rental income. So if they're purchasing a multifamily, we use 75% of the gross rent, just like Fannie and Freddie. And you can either provide a copy of the lease or the appraisal evidencing what the current rent is or the market rent. Um, if for some reason you do not want to include it, which I really caution because we have had some interesting scenarios. Um, if you're looking to eliminate it and that's because it's vacant, for example, if we've had situations that maybe the unit has been condemned and it's no longer rentable at the time, but the buyer is gonna you know, renovate and then be able to put it up for market, you can't really predict what that future rent is. I would say yes, that's a way an appraisal can evidence that it's vacant and not include it. However, if you're using a state housing finance agency program such as the MHP1 mortgage and you're using that income, if you're using it to qualify for your first mortgage and or another HFA program in your, um, in your lending footprint, we're all in, we include the 75%. Does the non-occupant co-borrower need to be on the deed? We just recommend following your uh, first mortgage practices. If you want them to execute the um, the mortgage and have them on the deed, we're fine with it. We have no restrictions. And I definitely just recommend um, in our income guidelines, we have um, household makeup section. I believe it's on pages three and four of that. And hopefully if you have any situations where you're confused about minors, custody, non-occupant co-borrowers, or um, 18 years or older full-time students, you can reference that. If a custody is 2575, do the children count? Um, so if it's your borrowers, the 25, we would exclude it. However, if you're using it to qualify, we would say that yes, you would want to um, count the children toward the household count. And honestly, it only helps your household because the more people who live in the property, essentially the higher the income threshold is. But if you ever have questions about custody, um, because it might not necessarily be 50-50, please reach out. We do understand that every um, household makeup is not of familial status either. Um, people sometimes have roommates, we see a lot of um, you know, elderly parents, uh, multi-generation households. Um, you know, we would include those elderly um, household members, their SSI, their disability, et cetera. Uh, we do have that also mapped out in our income guidelines. You have to submit all your documents uh, through our online system. We did not accept anything in email. So just something to note. Um, Continue to manage your EBP how, how pipeline. Um, I would recommend on a daily basis, really just having somebody who's the gatekeeper for your institution. Make sure you are looking at the first time homebuyer requirements that we've talked about. And a lot of people have already been asking this year about our front housing ratio, um, our front DTI. If it's over 37%, your institution has to provide compensating factors. These are also noted in our procedures. So what's their current rent? Uh, do they have between two and six months reserved? Do they have minimal back-end debt? Our system actually now, when it is over 37%, it actually brings these questions up for you to fill out. Um, we were getting a lot of things in the comments that said, you know, Fannie and Freddie, uh, we received a approved eligible. 
um, they're at 50% and just because they qualify on paper. That's not something that depicts sustaining home ownership, especially because these programs are typically for low to moderate income uh, buyers. And we want to make sure that they're successful. So um, if for some reason they don't have any of those compensating factors, your institution is really going to have to find a way to further depict their ability to repay. And if you do have a related party, um, which does include if they're a landlord, if it's a rent to own, um, they don't necessarily have to be a relative selling to a relative. You have to disclose that information and provide the appraised value. And the reason is, is our grant money cannot be used to bridge the gap between um, the purchase price and that appraised value. And then make sure that the PNS is, has at least 15 business days. So don't submit an expired PNS. Um, don't submit something that has a PNS that's only good for two days. Like I said, our turnaround time is 15 business days. We do the best we can to turn them around quickly, but we can never make those guarantees and we would never want to jeopardize your buyer. And also just communication is key. Transparency. Um, you're doing the second. You're doing the first mortgage. We're really only doing an underwrite based on income eligibility. Just make sure that something meets the spirit of the program. Um, you know, kind of check your moral compass. If something smells funny, um, it could be funny. We don't like to throw up the F word um, in the mortgage industry, but um, we just really want to make sure that these buyers that you're submitting and uh, reserving grant uh, funds for. Um, aren't fraudulent and they really truly meet the spirit of the program and just making sure that you have all your ducks in a row because there are a lot of institutions who really have those borrowers that truly need the money. All right, so when it comes to member action required, um, if we do not have everything um, in your submission in that enrollment, we will kick the file back, we call it MAR, um, we're releasing it back to you. We'll let you know what we're missing. We'll explain why something is insufficient if you think that um, it is adequate on your end. And just make sure you submit it within 10 business days or you explain the document. Um, maybe it's not something cookie cutter is like you sent a, a sale pay stub. Just really make sure you're working on that. And then just review that extension policy that we have. Um, here are some examples of some items that we typically see that are missing. Really just take the time to just review everything before submitting um, because when you are submitting that enrollment, they are reserved, um, the funds, but our 15 business day clock starts when we have all satisfactory information. So if we kick the file back and you're letting it delay, 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 our turnaround time is, is not going to start until we have every um, item that we've asked for. All right, and when it comes to the first time home buyer education and counseling, although a certificate is not required at enrollment, it does have to be through an approved agency. Um, we do have an approved agency um, list on our website. We take it from Chapa, HUD, and Niche. And if you do not see uh, a agency listed on this, please feel free to reach out. We try to do our best to capture everything. Um, however, there's so many subsidiaries and consolidations of education counseling agencies that sometimes we can't capture everything, especially if they're outside of New England. Um, that, that's a possibility depending on where they live at the time. Uh, maybe they're relocating. Um, when it comes to the online component, we only have three valid sources it's eHome America, Finally Home, which we um, added this year, and then Framework. Typically, we prefer that blended approach where they do the online education through one of these providers, but then they're partnering with an approved agency to do that counseling component. Our regulation is specific that they have to receive that counseling. Um, education is key, and although we don't have a minimum of um, eight hours we understand that's not realistic in this day and age and people like the online option because they can go through these modules at their leisure but if they go directly to these eHome America finally home or framework they have the option to opt out so 
So if you're ever unsure whether a certificate is uh, acceptable, here's an example. So this is somebody who went through Maha in Massachusetts and they uh, partnered with Framework to do the online component and then they went to Maha for the counseling, whether it was before or post closing. And this is pretty in trend with all the HFAs out there. Um, unfortunately, we don't accept Freddie Mac's um, program. I actually just did a, um, I actually signed myself up to see how it was. And honestly, it did not really give a, a true depiction and it was not really a lengthy um, program in comparison to Framework, which is now affiliated with Fannie Mae. Um, we don't accept anything else, so please don't upload an MGIC one. We don't accept that one either, um, and I hope that answers that. So just some reminders. Remember, this is income eligibility based. Um, the subject property can change, and don't submit placeholder documents, and enrollment is good for 90 days. I figure I wanted to do a poll first, so let's launch the poll that I've created. And um, feel free to weigh in. Awesome, everyone. So far, everybody is um is responding. We'll keep it open for maybe another minute. All right, so I will share, I will share the poll. So the answer is all adult household members 18 years and older when it comes to um, the income. That was a bit of a trick question um, when it comes to who do we count as the household member, but then whose income do we use? All right, and I do have another one. I'd like to pull up. Watching that now. Can a home buyer be swapped out with another home buyer in your pipeline? All right, I'm going to share this poll. So um, the answer is no. Each enrollment is home buyer specific. So if you have a situation that you have um, borrower A who all of a sudden is not proceeding with the first mortgage financing, but you have borrower B that is ready to go, you would need to request that withdrawal on home buyer A and then resubmit for home buyer B. And we can work with your institution. I recommend if you have a situation like that and there is um, opportunity to go into the income part of the community lending uh, platform, take that file as far as you can go and you can work with us. However, one of the questions I have is, is this on a first-come, first-served basis? So any fallout that happens goes back to the general pool, and every bank is not allotted an amount. So for people who are new, it's on a first-come, first-served basis. Um, unfortunately, because we have a lot of banks and credit unions who offer this throughout New England, there's no way for us to really uh, slice and dice an allotment. If we did that, we've done some analysis in the past, and maybe every institution would get one income eligible home buyer. Um, and that really just kind of goes to um, the premise of education's key, work with 
myself and our EVP How team, we're really great with technical assistance. We, we really take pride in being member centric because you're our customers and we are very um, passionate about home ownership. Um, if you know me by now, um, I, I love to crunch numbers and really get into the weeds just to make sure there um, are buyers that are eligible. And, um, you know, sometimes this isn't a cookie cutter underwriting process. Sometimes it can be looking like creative writing when it comes to our qualification of income because there is a difference. Um, and, you know, that really just goes to education, training, really appreciating. And once you really submit one eligible buyer, my premise is that, you know, it, it becomes easier. I used to work at a small one branch bank. We used to do it once a year and it was like riding a bike and really just taking training like this and having all the resources that uh, the Federal Home Loan Bank provides really can only help. All right, just wanna hide the poll. All right. All right, so tips and tricks. This is where I would like to uh, conclude today's session. Do not promise your funds to a home buyer prior to receiving the enrollment approval, definitely important. Um, you can say that a buyer, whether it's at pre-approval or pre-qual, say they're contingent upon the funds to make sure that your numbers tick and tie out when you're doing your first mortgage financing. We also do see people at PNS saying that they're contingent. That's a great layer to protect your borrower if for some reason they do not receive the funds and that way you can kind of work through um, what would be the alternative, if you will, um, but don't promise it to them because it is first come, first serve. Please do not provide more documentation than requested. Can't say that enough. So for example, where a pay sub or a VOE do not give us both, if we have both, we will use the higher of the two, um, which typically sometimes ends up being the VOE. Um, certain circumstances, we might ask you for a VOE because maybe the projection of um, the income prospectively based on that year to date doesn't really tie out with that gross weekly or bi-weekly amount. Maybe that amount is higher. We might question it. Um, we do have that in our income guidelines if it does come down to that. And then also telling us if income has changed. Um, we do appreciate the transparency and like I mentioned before, um, just really making sure that it meets the spirit of the program. Um, However, if for some reason something has changed, we don't require additional documentation. Once it's been approved, it's been approved. However, I will caution you that if you are in a situation where that borrower has, for example, they had a second job and maybe all of a sudden they are not um, working that job anymore and they said that they were only doing it for um, covering their closing costs, and they left the organization, and then you kind of find out at your clear to close level that all of a sudden, um, oh, they picked up that second job, and um, they are um, working it again. Actually, they're they're working more hours. Um, that's something that doesn't meet the spirit of the program. So I just like to caution, really, just like I said, what meets the spirit of the program. But do queue up your borrowers by entering their income into the system once we've released the first amount. Um, if you ever get stuck and the income isn't projecting correctly, maybe you thought it was a pay stub, but then you wanted to go VOE, when in doubt, just delete that household member from the table. And then that way you can go back and make corrections. And more importantly, promote the program. It's super important. We do have our flyers and marketing materials that are right in the community lending platform once you click into EBP how they are for both programs to share we used to have separate ones but we're really trying to um, kind of streamline the way we advertise and work with your institutions there's no risk of the buyer paying money back and really the qualification criteria is purely income we do have some more questions on page seven the slide current in the view, and my apologies for um, going past slide seven, where it says review disclosure and borrower, which is which handout is it referring to? Is it the EBP how disclosure? Yes, that is what it. Um, I was referencing earlier. Would a 42 DTI be too high to consider if we have compensating factors? 
The answer would be no. Like I said, if you can demonstrate one of those three compensating factors that I mentioned, um, that certainly is not. And we do understand, especially with these higher interest rates, um, maybe somebody does want a fixed rate and um, maybe somebody wants an arm. We all know that uh, that housing ratio can drastically differ. And um, another question about mortgage products. You might have already answered. Can this be combined with an FHA mortgage? Yes, it can. Um, I just would like to direct you um, when you close it. We do have a specific deed restriction mortgage for FHA. Um, that's because they require certain language. And when you go to submit to their portal, they're going to want that specific document. What is the maximum GTI ratio with compensating factors? That's kind of difficult. Um, we're not like Fannie and Freddie where it's a 50 to 52. Um, as long as you can demonstrate their ability to repay with the areas that I mentioned, um, that really is kind of, um, it just, it depends. It depends on this interest rate environment. But if you don't have somebody who can provide the compensating factors that I mentioned, I would say that it, it would not qualify. Um, what else? If using how, does the grant need to appear in the contract or the addendum? So no, it's, the how grant does not need to appear in the contract or the addendum for either of our programs. However, we do see a lot of people who do put that on there just to protect their buyers. And we completely understand that. So um, it, it's not a requirement. How, however, it is a best practice where a lot of institutions find success in that. If the calculation of income is done incorrectly, but the borrower qualifies for how, do we have to submit a new application or can we switch it? That's a great question. So there is a way when you're in the system, say you thought it was for EVP and it's better suited for how this year and vice versa, it's actually gonna direct you and let you know what program that they are eligible for. And then you're just gonna wanna make sure that you have those different nuances from either program because we did discuss that, you know, they do have a minimum down payment difference um there's mortgage revenue bonds for the max purchase price for how etc um and one other thing is also you see that we can layer can we layer with other down payment assistance your website says otherwise um no yes you you can um you can layer it with other down payment assistance the um of course they're only eligible for either ebp or how they don't qualify for both um, the other thing is that if it is an affordable unit that has received um, affordable housing funding through AHP, then that is um, potential that they could not um, receive our EBP or HAL grant, but always reach out to us. We can look that up for you. Using, yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, one question about the. Um, mortgage revenue bond limits. Uh, I noticed that Worcester County Mass is not listed under the limits as it's fallen to other counties this year. So yes, unfortunately, um, the IRS has made some enhancements. So you might not see counties that you've seen previously. I know the state of Connecticut, there was, I think, two counties that um, they removed and it just might be based on their analytics. So if you don't see a county, they automatically fall into the other counties category. Um, is PMI included in the qualifying DTI? Asking if MI companies do not do not um, include in the DTI. Uh, so yes, we do include that in there, um, especially if it is monthly. Can you confirm is primary residence up to four units okay? Yes, we we can do four um, four family properties. By DTI, do you mean housing DTI? Yes. So we only care about the front DTI, we do not care about the back. However, if you're using a compensating factor that they have minimal back end debt, that's the only time that we would um, inquire about it. And we're not looking for documentation. When we ask for these compensating factors, you're just gonna list them because you're seeing the full scope of the 1003. We don't ask for a 1003. We don't ask for a 1008. Um, we don't wanna see bank statements. We don't wanna see credit reports. Please do not send them. Um, just be able to provide an answer by commenting on those three um, areas. When are appraisals required? So 
for appraisals, we don't require copies of the appraisals. However, if you do have a two to four unit and your rent documentation is going to be based on the market rent, we would require an appraisal for manufactured homes. We do require an appraisal at some point. Um, however, we have found in the past that with manufactured homes, sometimes the appraisals aren't ready right away when you're submitting. We don't want that to be a deterrent. As long as you can provide the listing that shows um, that that manufactured home is either permanently affixed or wheels up axles down, um, we're fine with that. And if you ever have questions um, about appraisals, feel free to ask. Um, so the presentation is under the handouts and we're also gonna be providing the recording um, once we've concluded today's session. I think we have, I think we have covered everything. These are all very good questions and um, it gets me really excited for this year. So also in addition to the handouts, we have provided some hyperlinks in this PDF that will direct you to a lot of the materials that I mentioned in today's training. Um, thank you so much. Um, I hope this information serves you well. If you ever have questions, here's our EBP How team. And actually this presentation was done earlier in the year and I am pleased to say that we do have another analyst joining our team um, for this year in EBP and how. Her name is Isabel and she will actually be onboarding next week before we release funds. I also wanna just mention that we will be announcing and releasing a new program and it is for down payment and closing cost assistance. It is under the special purpose credit program parameters. Stay tuned, you might have heard this on the street, but um, we will be launching that hopefully in June and it's gonna be targeting people of color. And we uh, hope you reach out to us if you're very interested. We'll be circulating that announcement, hopefully um, mid spring, maybe end of spring. Um, and we hope that you also are interested in that program too. Thank you so much. Really appreciate all these questions. Um, do not hesitate to reach out to us. Um, we know that the uh, housing market is extremely challenging, especially with interest rates, your pipelines, and we're only here to be partners of your institution. And um, we're very fortunate that you are participating with the Federal Home Loan Bank. Thank you, everyone.